here this morning, you remember I said the title of my message tonight is we need some SMA in our spiritual DNA. Mm -hmm. Now it's not uh, maybe food I'm talking about SMA. You probably click on what that SMA stands for. Anybody click on what that stands for? SMA. From this reading? Daniel chapter Yes. Shadrach, Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, we'll read from verse 1 through verse 25. Just I might be reading, but we need to sort of read all these verses to get a gist of what's happening. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governor, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, and the counselors, and the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province were gathered together under the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at the time when you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackcloth, the psaltery, the delusimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship, worshipeth shall the saint are be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackcloth, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. The accuser of the brethren is always around for us. They speak and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man sh that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackcloth, the psaltery, the delusimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true? O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if you be ready, that at that time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackcloth, the psaltery, and the lucimer, and all the kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, you shall be cast in the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace, and who, it is that, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? That was a question he was asking. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able, amen, yes, to Lord. deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Yes. And he will deliver us yes, out Lord. of thy hand, O king. That's what they said. Yes. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now you've got to picture the scene here. They're in front of the king, but they're in front of all these other uh, leading uh, officials of his day, and they're in front of all the other people as well, of the nations and languages. And these three guys are taking their stand in front of all of these people. Maybe in their hearts they were trembling, but they were still taking a stand of faith and trust. Oh, yeah. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed. That's how angry this man became. And this is how the enemy gets angry, folks, whenever we take our stand and when he says, say yes, and we say no. Amen. 
no. Not Ulster says no. Say your God says no. And Abednego, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont, or usually to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in the, this army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, there's something about that that's interesting. Why did he ask the most mighty men to bind just three guys? Because he's seen something in them. Mm -hmm. He sees something supernatural in these guys that he didn't see and the others that he had to get his most mighty men, not just mighty, but the most mighty and strong, muscular men, warriors to come and bind these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their, gar and, and their garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot. Listen what happened. The flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm -hmm. Enemy, watch out what you yeah. do to the child of God. Yeah. These three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, burned in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. This just reminds me, just it came into my thoughts just there now, about you know, touching God's anointed, touching God's people, the enemy having a go at God's people. Yeah. Remember a place I worked in many, many years ago, and there was one guy there, and there was myself and another Christian worked there. But there was one day I was doing something, I was filling a, a, a this, this place used to make army equipment, you know, like, not, not guns, but used to make, like, a, a, the bulletproof shelters and stuff like that, their security huts and stuff. And I remember this guy was standing beside me, and he did give us hassle before, but this day, he started cursing at me, swearing at me, blaspheming the name of Jesus. And the other Christian was with me standing there too. He said, like, hey, well, there's no need for all that. Right? He gave it to me, something shocking. And I can remember my old pastor, James McConnell. God bless him, he's in the glory of God. I remember him saying one time before, there was a man gave him hassle one time at one of the building sites of the churches. And he says, he went and asked the Lord to, to just give him something else to think about. And I that came straight to me and I walked off into the toilets and I says, Lord, will you give this man something else to think about? He's torturing us as Christians. I walked, was walking out of the toilets and I seen a commotion going on. And he was in the middle of these other guys coming into the first aid room. And I walked in to see what had happened to him because I was concerned for him at the same time. He had been out, and, and there's a fire in the back of the, the, the warehouse burning, and he had got a drum, a plastic drum, and did not realize that in it was flammable liquid, and he threw it under the fire and it exploded in his face. And he was standing in the kitchen then by himself in the first aid area, and I was looking at him, he just looked at me, and I almost committed, he says, do not touch God's children. I said, Lord, I didn't mean to do something like that. <laughs> just give me something else to think about. But this is, this is what happened. And I remember Pastor McConnell telling that story, and I said, well, I'm going to take that up, and I'm going to see what happens if I do that. And that's what the Lord did. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto, and unto the, the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And listen what he says. And the form of the fourth man is like the Son of God. Bless so you, Lord. Will add a blessing to his own precious word. Very briefly. In the Lord's precious Praise, Praise you, Lord. Father, we just pray tonight for the help of the Holy Spirit tonight. We pray that he will come right now and take these words spoken from these lips of clay and that he will use them tonight to bring glory and honor unto the precious name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for every head bowed in your presence tonight. We thank you for every person that's made the effort to be here this evening. We just give you all the glory yes. and all the honor in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord God, that the days will come when this when every section of this sanctuary will be filled to capacity, yes. where there will be extra seats put up, there will be people sitting in the foyer, Lord, there will be people sitting upstairs watching the, the service on the, the TV up there. Lord, we pray that you will move in a spectacular yes, way. Lord. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. 
Amen. 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 Surely our imagination is captured when we read this passage about these three Hebrew guys, these children of God, three children of the Most High God. They belong to the King of Glory. This passage before us today is filled with faith, with courage and with spiritual tenacity and a triumphant spirit that would surely do anybody's hearts good who is facing the challenges of life. And we all face the challenges of life. What we see here are three children of God actually living out the words of the Apostle Paul recorded in Romans 8 verse 37 to 39. And maybe the Apostle Paul had these three Hebrew boys in mind when he was writing these words, along with his other experiences that he had in his own life. But this is what he says, and we're familiar with the verses. He says, No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Sometimes, folks, we don't feel like conquerors. I don't feel like a conqueror some days either. I feel like I've been conquered. I have been a few conquerors along the way. But we are more, Paul says, than conquerors through him that loved us. Paul wasn't somebody speaking from a highfalutin spiritual place where he had never been affected by the things of life. We read in Corinthians all the things that Paul went through, despite and, and as well as all the, the troubles and problems of the church as well. So he's a man that was speaking from experience. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. He says, for I am persuaded. Now we've got to be persuaded about the truths of God. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature that would ever exist. And I have that little bit. Shall be able to separate us, or divide us, or take us away from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These three guys made <clears throat> it into the great hall of faith in Hebrews 11, verse 34, where it says this about God's people, that they quenched the violence of fire. And let us remind ourselves that these were just ordinary people, ordinary people like you and I. Following his victory, Nebuchadnezzar ordered that the best and the brightest young men of Judah be deported to Babylon. His plan was this, folks, to train these young men for three years and then give, some, give them some positions within the royal courts. And uh, we read of that in chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. You want to find that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were among this group that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to train. The three years of training in Babylon, you listen to this, was really an attempt by Nebuchadnezzar to brainwash these Jewish captives. He wanted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the others to become so indoctrinated by the Babylonian culture, mindset, and ideology that at the end of their training, they would think like, they would act like, and they would live like the Babylonians. And the enemy is doing the same today, brothers and sisters, because Babylonian speaks of the world and of the world's ideologies and the world's culture and the world's way of thinking. And if it could, it would shape our minds and brainwash us. And listen, folks, people are being brainwashed by the media. People are being brainwashed by all kinds of things that are being said and done today that are supposed to be right, what the scripture says, and are wrong. <clears throat> Even the names of the young men were changed. If you're not aware of this, to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whose names were originally Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. Their, name, their Jewish names honored the Lord, but their new names honored the gods of Babylon. The Babylonians, folks, they could change their names. However, they could not change their heart, nor could they weaken their faith in God. They would remain loyal to God, the God of Israel, no matter what would happen. Extreme pressure was placed upon these three children of God. For what? To be conformed to the thinking and the ideology of their day. But they stayed true to the living God. They were the minority, but they still stayed true to the living God. And we know the end of the story that that paid off. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 12 and verse 2, Do not be conformed. To the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect 
will of God. If we are fleeting from worldly ideology into the theology and back and forth, we will never be able to know what is the acceptable and the perfect will of God. We will be in confusion, brothers and sisters, because we will then be seduced by seducing spirits and doctrines of devils which present themselves with a cloak of religion, which present themselves with a form of truth, a measure of the truth. Remember, the devil will use a measure of the truth to make it look truthful, to make it look like it's from God, but you've got to analyze what he is telling you and look at the word of God, and if it doesn't line up with scripture, then you've got to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Now more than ever, folks, we are before, now more than ever before as we approach the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can see how the system of this world is trying to push the believer into its mold and its humanistic and liberal ideologies which are creeping also into the church of Jesus Christ as well and are also being preached from some pulpits by men or women who are not born of the Spirit of God and leading others astray with a humanistic a liberal ideologies, liberal theologies and social gospels and they will pay the price. They will stand before Almighty God. Probably more now than ever we need to contend for the faith and be prepared for the persecution that will come. You know, Jesus said that in the last days the deception would be so strong and the delusions would be so strong that if it was possible, the very elect of God would be deceived. That's strong deception, folks. And folks, listen, he doesn't come like a raging lion. He goes about like a roaring lion, but he doesn't come to you as that. Because if he did, you would yeah. see him right away and you'd know it was him. He clothes himself yeah. and other things. And he protects himself that way so as he can get in and deceive and delude and decept, bring deception into the believer's life. Jesus said this in John 16, 33. He says, in the world you shall have tribulation. He said, we're going to have it. He says, but... Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John echoed these words in 1 John 5 and verse 4 when he said, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Are you born of God tonight? Yes. Then we can overcome the world. We have the power within us to overcome the world. But we need to tap into that power when the world's ideologies, the world system and the world's deception is coming down and pressurizing us to weaken and to give in. We need to tap into that power. And that power is the Holy Spirit. And this is the victory, John said, that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith in Christ. These three children of God were facing probably one of the most trying and testing times of their faith and trust in God that they had ever faced or would ever face. But they were resolute and they were determined that they would not waver in their trust for God. Every Christian is going to face times when their trust in God is tested to the limit. We'll all be tested maybe in different ways, but we will be tested. And maybe you're in the process now of being tested. Tested to trust God for your family. Tested to trust God for your needs. Tested to trust God for your health. Tested to trust God for your finances. We will be tested in many ways. But nevertheless, our faith in God will be challenged. Just listen to what the Apostle Peter said. In 1 Peter 4, verse 12 to 13, he said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Don't think it's a strange thing. As, some, as though some strange thing happened to you. Listen to what he says. I don't think we often do this. But rejoice. <laughs> when the challenge comes, when the fiery trial is coming, he says rejoice. To the extent that you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be gl glory, glad with exceeding joy. Rejoice when we are in trials. How often do we do that? We do the opposite, most likely. We moan and we complain and, and we get out our violin, woe is me. And we get a wee pity party going in our own corner when the Bible says rejoice. You see, when the, you see, whenever we start to rejoice when the fiery trials are coming for us, the enemy can't understand that. He gets confused and he probably scratches his 
thorn got his, his horns on his head, and he, he doesn't have horns on his head, but, but not all he, he probably scratched his head. That wasn't meant to work out like that. Why are they still rejoicing? They're supposed to be under pressure. They're supposed to be doubting their God. They're supposed to be doubting their faith. But they're rejoicing. It gets the devil confused and the, all the demons of hell looking at Satan and saying, that wasn't work, didn't work out right, did it? <laughs> no, it didn't because those people have realized who their God is. That's and in the midst of their trial, in the midst of that fiery furnace, there's another man with them and his name is Jesus Christ. Praise your name, Lord. This passage tells Thank us what you, Lord. will happen when we are determined to stay faithful to God in the midst of adversity and persecution. There are five things that I'd just like to highlight in this passage tonight. Firstly, if you trust God, your faith will be challenged. Mm -hmm. And we see that in chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. The proud king had set up a golden image in the plain of Dura, and it was a huge monument, huge. 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and it was probably a replica of the image of the king himself that he had seen in a dream in chapter 2. Everyone was commanded, every single person was commanded to be present at the dedication of this image. Boy, this man was really full of himself, wasn't he? It was a spectacular occasion, but a terrible penalty was imposed on any person who refused to bow down to worship this golden image. Now, there's other teachings about that golden image that we'll have to get into tonight, but they're very interesting if you wish to do so yourself. We read in verse 12 that the three government officials refused to bow down, to follow the crowd, and to renounce their God and his commands. They were determined to stand out against this evil thing and to be faithful to the Lord at all costs. They hadn't got the stuff that we have today, folks, as we would think, oh, we've got a worship time and all, we've got all those things to encourage us, we've got CDs galore, we've got a, a, a podcast galore, all these things to listen to and to, to read and so forth. These boys had none of this stuff, but they had something that maybe we don't have. Mm -hmm. They had steel in their soul, they had steel yeah. in their back home, and they had the faith of God and the faith in God as well, and they were determined that they were going to stand against this evil act and be an example. It's so easy to go with the crowd. It's so easy to let the herd instinct dominate us. And therefore, we fail the Lord. But these three men were victorious in the hour of their supreme testing. Their trust was in God. But as is always the case, their faith was challenged. It will not go unchallenged. If you trust God, secondly, you will be tempted to compromise your faith. We read this in verses 8 to 10, 8, uh, 18. The Chaldeans reported to the king that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had not obeyed his commands. The king then reacted. He was furious. Even his face changed and got distorted. He was that angry. I believe it was a demon within the man that was distorting his whole visage and his whole image. And we see that in verse 13 to 15 that he sent for them and invited them to reconsider their decision. Can you imagine that moment in time when they're standing before the king and his face is distorted and contorted and twisted with anger? His blood vessels in his neck were really bursting out of his neck as he was looking at these three guys who he had brought on board to do counseling work within his own ministry and government, the things he was doing. But can you imagine that moment he stood in front of everybody and the quietness must have covered the crowd to hear what these men were going to say, what these men were going to do. You could have heard a pin drop among all the music that was being played. It was stopped. And King Nebuchadnezzar, and they can imagine all those other wimps that are standing about there were terrified of him. Surely, they, surely they'll compromise. Surely they will. Here was the temptation to compromise. Really what was in effect he was saying to them was, just do this one thing. Just this one thing. Nobody will see you. Nobody will know. Just do it to please me. It won't harm you. It won't harm anybody else. Just do it this once and it will all be over. That's what the enemy says to us, doesn't he? Just, just this one thing. Just do it the once. Nobody will see. Nobody will care. Now you're not going to harm anybody else. It will all soon be over. Just do this one thing. And we read of that in verses 16 to 18. Then we see that they steadfastly refused. They refused to save their lives at the expense of their conscience and to bring dishonor upon the name of the Lord. So they defied the king. 
knowing what the consequences were. They said in verse 18, we will not. Oh, they didn't like that. We will not. Are we loyal enough to stand out with the minority to be one of the three against thousands of others that follow the crowd? Moses was faced with this temptation and he resisted it. Hebrews 11 verse 24 to 27, we read, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, listen, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, mm -hmm. esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, this to this, not Hearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Amen. The eye of faith. Moses could see, I believe, the Son of God in his territory. <coughs> so was Jesus tempted to compromise also in the wilderness, and we read that in Matthew 4. Verses 1 to 11, also in Luke's Gospel as well. Luke 4. In Acts chapter 7, verse 54 to 60. So was Stephen, and he refused it, and he was stoned to death. God gives us wonderful promises that no temptation will ever prove too strong for any of his children. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Listen to what it says. Paul said to the believers at Corinth, No temptation has overtaken you except as such is common to man. Here's another but. But God is faithful. Bless your name, Lord. Son of his faithfulness to me. But God is faithful. Thank who you. will not allow you to be tempted or tested beyond what you are able. Thank you, Lord. But with the temptation or the testing or the trial, will also make the way of escape. Yes. Why? That you may be able to bear it. Thank you. The thing is, if we take the way of escape that he offers us, and thirdly, if you trust God, you will confidently submit to his will. We see him doing that in verse 17 and 18 of our reading. In spite of the dreadful alternative facing them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego steadfastly refused to worship the golden image because their whole trust was in God. They had confidence, firstly, in the power of their God. They said, the God we serve is evil. We don't know or read of any such tests or trials that they had to go through before, but there was obviously things in their life from the past where they have proved God to be faithful, where they have proved God to be able, where they have proved God to be strong enough, powerful enough, willing enough, able enough to deliver them. And we can do the same, brothers and sisters, as well. Whenever we're faced with situations in the present, surely we can look back on the past and we can say, God delivered me then. God healed me then. God met the need then. God guided me then. God will do it again today. Amen. Praise you, Lord. He is able. Genesis 18 and 14 tells us nothing is too hard for him. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 26, all things are possible to him. He is the God of miracles still today. Then they also had confidence in the purpose of God. They said, even if he does not deliver us, in other words, God can deliver us. And if it says, well, he will deliver us, but he may not, it may be as well for us to suffer and die. And if that's the case, we will do so. I'm sure that totally confused the king. He had never seen a faith like this in a God that he had never really heard about or knew about. We don't know what his will is. And we don't mind what they're thinking. For his will is always the best. Faith is ready to trust God to fulfill his purpose, whatever that may be. So that we can say, as Job was able to say in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The steadfast refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made the king furious. 
beyond description. And he commanded the furnace to be heated again and again and again, and the three men to be cast into that fiery furnace. What it must have been like, folks, to be standing at the entrance of that furnace and tied and pushed in there, they fell on their knees on, on the floor. And those flames and that heat had even destroyed those mighty men that bound them up as soon as they opened the furnace. They were consumed. And here's these three young men standing at the beginning of this furnace. I wonder, did they think to themselves, well, here, them guys there were consumed by the flames. We're still standing. <laughs> There's hope yet here. Shall we go further in? They were taken. They were wiped out with one swoop. We're still standing here. Mighty men, mighty soldiers. But they served a mighty God. <clears throat> the steadfast uh, refusal made the king absolutely furious. And he commanded the furnace to be heated again and again. Seven times hotter than usual. And they were cast into the fire. What a terrible experience, we may say. But it was also a wonderful experience. But no more wonderful than the experience that we may have two folks whenever we are faithful to the Lord also. Fourthly, if you trust God, you will never be alone. We see this in verse 24 to 27. They were in the fire, but they were not alone in that fire. For the Lord was there with them. I don't know if they were conscious of the Lord being there. I don't know if they were conscious of God's presence there. But he was there. Just as he is with his people when they suffer in his name. He was there. And the king pronounced that he seen a fourth person in the fire. I can imagine getting up off his throne and looking into the fire. He said, boys, how many of you cast in there? Three. I can see four people in that fire. I can see four men walking about in the fire and they're not even burned. And when they come out, we're told there wasn't even a hair on their body that was singed. Not even a smell of burning smoke or anything on their clothes when they come out of it. Thank you, Lord. The presence of God just wrapped itself right around them and shielded them from that fire. Isaiah 43 and 2 says this to the people of God. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. That's speaking about, I believe, the Red Sea parting and the people of God going across that Red Sea. And of course, Pharaoh, the enemy, was furious. Like Nebuchadnezzar was furious. And he said to his soldiers, go after them. And they went after them. And the sea drowned every one of them. You pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. And that's what they experienced, these three Hebrew children, these three children of God. Even David said this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Somebody here tonight, you're walking through some kind of valley, a valley experience. may not be the valley of death, but it might feel like death is all around you. It might feel morbid. It might feel dull and dark and dreary. But listen, fear no evil because the word of God yeah. has promised Amen. that there is one who is walking beside you through that valley and his name is Jesus yes. Christ, the son of the living God. Thank you. Your Lord and your staff, they comfort me. Yes. Just as he walked with those two on the road to a mess, remember that? Mm -hmm. And he walked something maybe several miles before they realized that it was actually Jesus walking with them. And when he walked with them, folks, every step they took, he took as he was walking with them and opened the scriptures and expounded unto them about Christ and about the sufferings of Christ. And then they began to realize and they said, they're not our heart burned within us. Whether we walked, uh, he walked and taught us along the way. They realized then it was Christ. But he walked with them. That whole journey, he walked with them. They were unaware of it at the start. They thought, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Have you, not, have you not heard about what has happened? And he says, tell me what has happened. They were so disappointed. They were so full of discouragement. They were so full of anguish that it blinded their eyes to see who he was. And sometimes we're like that too. We're so full of discouragement, disappointment, anguish, fear about what's going on, anxiousness about what's going on in our lives that we can't see that right beside us, Jesus is walking with us. David said, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. 
what man can do unto me. That's right. The Lord is on my side. Yes. The Lord is on your side. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And that standard, I believe, is this word of God here today. And you've got to take those scriptures, that sword of the Spirit, and tell him the Lord is with me. The Lord is with me, and he will never forsake me. That doesn't mean you're going to have goosebumps every day. That doesn't mean you're going to feel his presence tangibly every day. But that doesn't change the fact that his promise remains the same, that he is with you all the way. I love that verse in Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. David had walked through many shadows. David had went through many valleys. David had experienced many encounters of evil, but he had learned from experience that the Lord his God was with him. The Apostle Paul testified of this in 2 Timothy 4, verse 16 to 17, when he was coming to his execution. He said, at my first defense, no one stood with me. Think of all the people who admired Paul as an apostle. Now he's left with nobody. He says, all forsook me. Every one of them forsook him. But may it not be led to their charge, he says. But the Lord stood with me. Yes. The Lord stood with him. Paul recognized that the Lord had stood with him. And he says, and strengthened me. So that the message may be preached fully through me. And that all the Gentiles may hear. Also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. I don't think it was a physical lion, but I believe it was a, a, a personage of that day who was persecuting the children of God. The presence of the Lord was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was in the fire, and the fire was the guarantee of their protection. Even the fire could not touch them, because it was God's will that the fire should not touch them. And being tried and tested and cast out. By these men, these men, these these three were now brought into sweeter communion with the Lord than they had ever been before. And that's what happens when we are taken through the furnace. God never calls us to enter the furnace alone. He, he is always with us and he blesses us in the furnace in a way that we would never have experienced had we not gone through the furnace in the first place. That's what 1 Peter 1 7 says. Concerning the furnace. Why do we go through it? Why does God let us go through such things in our life as Christians? That the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes. Though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's for the genuineness of your this is not the end of the story. <clears throat> One reason the Lord allows us to be tested is that by our confidence in him in the trial, and by the manifestation of his power and glory in that trial, others may be blessed and his kingdom may be extended. Because this is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He commanded everybody to bow the knee to their God. Amen. <laughs> what a turnaround. Yes. Number five. I'm going to close. If you trust God, others will be blessed. We see this in verse 28 to 30. What a testimony from a pagan king. That was one minute was so furious at these men who worshipped Jehovah to a testimony of worshipping the same God. But suppose these three had compromised. Just suppose they had said to each other, okay guys, it's not worth it during this fire. Let's just do this once. That's all he's requiring of us. Just to compromise this once. And it'll be all over. And people will forget about it. It'll be old news the next day. It'll be something else for him. How different the whole outcome would have been. The king would have still been a heathen king. The people would have still been a heathen people. But because of what they did, regardless of whether they survived it or not, I still believe that God would have been honored. Often we are placed in a situation of difficulty where it seems that if we trust God and seek his grace to glorify him in the trial, others will be wonderfully blessed and helped by our own testimony. We can't have testimonies, it's often said, without a test. Test a moment. Just listen to Psalm 66, verse 10 to 12, as I finish. 
It says this in Psalm 56, verse 10 to 12. For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and we went through water. Listen, here's another book. But you brought us out to a rich fulfillment. Bless your name, Lord. May God bless his word in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Let's just pray. So I'll wait with me. Heart of course. So Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight in the precious name that's above every other name. The name of Jesus. All the power that is in his name tonight. We thank you for that power. We thank you for his name. We exalt his name. We glorify his name. We uplift his name. We honor his name. We worship his name. It's a name above all other names. And Father, we pray tonight for the covering of the precious blood of Jesus upon each and every one of us as we would leave this service tonight. Because as we have heard these things, the enemy will also be awaited, Father, with his attacks, with his onslaught, with his deception. But Father, we thank you that when we stand firm in the word of God, we can resist the devil and he will flee from us. Father, we thank you for the sword of the spirit for the word of God. We pray tonight, Heavenly Father, that you will just keep your hand on every individual here tonight. For those who may be anxious about things tonight, your word tells us, you said yourself, be anxious for nothing. Why are we anxious, you said? We're to take heed and look at the, 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 the lilies of the field. We take, look at creation and nature, the fowls of the earth, how you look after them. Lord, they, 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 they gather in the barns. They don't do anything like that, but you feed them. Lord, you encourage us not to be anxious because you know the things we have need of before we even ask you for those things. Lord, you are a good heavenly Father. Bless you, Lord. You love us with an unending love. Father, tonight we just ask that, Lord, for those that have, will listen online, we pray that you'll encourage them and strengthen them in their faith. And for every single person that may be facing difficult, trying circumstances today, this week that lies ahead of them, or even in the days to come, Father, the months down the line, that you'd bring something from this word to their remembrance again that will help them and encourage them. Father, we just pray now, take us to our homes and safety. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless you, Lord. Praise the Lord.